it's just a delight. Um, my husband is thrilled I'm here in 1967. He almost came here uh, as an English major, and fortunately he came to Penn because that's where I met him. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, my life would be very different, but uh, I, I'm just delighted. You have a beautiful campus here, and you have two other campuses, I think, so um, what, what a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to try to kind of wander through a number of studies and um, talk about this program of research that's been, that has been evolving since about um, 2000 when I was a professor at University of Cincinnati and I need to acknowledge them because that's where I got my start. Um, I think Cincinnati probably is similar to Buffalo in that you have not only a strong research mission but you also have a, research, a, a regional mission to educate people within your communities both at the undergraduate and also at the doctoral level. So you, you have kind of multiple competing, you have uh, importance in your community, you have importance in, in, in training high-level scholars, and you also have importance in training people who are going to go out more at the regional level and do the stuff that has to be done. So um, I feel like in some ways I've come home um, because University of Cincinnati is so similar. But Penn's kind of a different kind of environment that is equally important, but uh, is, I think um, um, it, it's, it's a different sense. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, developing a program of research and then um, how, how that drifts and goes other places and sometimes how you can, as an investigator and an investigative team, be informed uh, and really do some different things with the science as it builds and grows. I, I have so many thanks to uh, National Institutes of Health um, in, in this area, because um, those of you who work with violence against women know it is hard to get funding to do that kind of work. And so, uh, just like all of us, um, I've managed to do the work by framing it in different ways. Uh, some of my work's been framed around um, alcohol and substance use, um, because there's money there and you can do that. And some of it's been uh, framed around health disparities. And, and that's sometimes the, the secret, I think, for those of us who are working in the area of violence against women with figuring out how to do that. Um, the um, clustering together a series of grants, both uh, one of these was an SBIR, Small Business Innovation Grant. Three of them were R01s, two of them were supplements. And by doing that clustering, um, I've been able to do some of the things that I'm passionate about as well as doing things that are the Institute priorities and that's always our, our juggle and our challenge I think as, as, as scientists. So um, I, I stumbled into this. I'm a physiologist, critical care kind of person. I taught physiology to the CRNAs and nurse anest anesthesia students for a long time in Cincinnati. Um, I was not a violence against women. Per I was an injury person, but car crash, alcohol, drinking, that was, that was where most of my funding was. But the hospital very much wanted to start a sexual assault nurse examiner program in, in the 90s in Cincinnati. And because I'm a woman and believe in women's health and uh, am, a, uh, am interested in, in violence prevention, I helped them start the program, get funding to do it. And as I did that, I realized that as an injury scientist, we just don't know a whole lot about injury in the setting and context of sexual assault. When, when um, people are uh, sexually assaulted, the exam that's done is really done for two reasons. Uh, there's, uh, the injuries need to be investigated and treated, but usually the injuries are, um, they, they can be severe, but when you look at the epidemiology of the injuries after sexual assault, they tend to be fairly minor injuries that after a week or two or three will resolve. Most of them don't really need a lot of medical management, um, but there cer certainly is a, an important healthcare issue on, on screening for sexually transmitted infections. Um, the, probably the um, more emphasis is of, often placed on the, the criminal justice, legal, and judicial significance of injuries. There was a fair amount of work between 1990 and 2010 showing that women who are injured tend to have a different journey through, through the criminal justice system than women who aren't injured. Um, you, can have, you can be raped and have no injuries at all, and that has no reflection on whether you were really raped or not. But women who are raped and have uh, detectable injuries 
tend to have a different experience. They're all the way through, they're, they're more likely to have um, the, pers the person um, charged. The, the uh, legal out outcomes are different. Um, uh, people who have injuries are like more likely to see the assailant incarcerated. Um, those of you with legal va backgrounds can comment on this when we get to the, the uh, question and answer um, situation. But there, there is pretty clear um, science that says that if a woman's injured, if a man or a woman is injured, if those injuries are documented well in, a, in an exam, that the outcome once the, the person is uh, brought through the criminal justice system is different. And these are just a few of the studies, one that um, you know, from between 2000 uh, and 2010. The first one um, is by Rachel Jukes, who's done some really good work in South Africa. Uh, what her team found that was that an, a conviction was more likely if there were documented injuries, whether non-genital injuries alone uh, or anal genital injuries or both. And interestingly, DNA was not associated with case outcome in her series. And then McGregor's done a number of studies uh, found um, that women with moderate or severe injuries were three times more likely to have charges uh, filed than those with no injury or mild injury. Now this sets up the, con uh, the conundrum that, I mean, you don't want women to be injured, but the, but the point is if women are injured, it, it is better as far as uh, the criminal justice system if those injuries are, are clearly and carefully documented. Um, that, um, begs the issue of whether women should have to go through a very difficult exam, and I think that's a whole other question or an issue that we might want to talk about. Um, after sexual assault, the prevalence of genital injury is, is wide-ranging depending on who, who you look at, uh, whose work you look at, uh, and what technique you use uh, to look for injuries. Um, Non-genital injury ranges from 32 to 76 percent. Um, the extent and pattern of injury becomes important, and that's where some of my line of work has gone. Can we use genital injury to get some kind of sense about uh, consent versus lack of consent? What does injury look like in women who have sexual intercourse uh, with consent? And what does it look like when um, uh, women have sexual intercourse without consent? And um, I'll, I'll show you some of the data on that in a bit. Um, there, there are really three techniques to assess for injury. Gross direct visualization, which just means that the examiner just literally looks for injury with his or her eyes. There are staining techniques, uh, contrast media that you can um, paint on the skin and, and internally as well, um, and then remove it and you can actually see injury. Um, and then colposcopy, which is a magnification system. This is one of our uh, examiners in Puerto Rico uh, with the, col the colposcope. Uh, it's, it's just a little binoculars that you can use to see if you can find additional injuries. So these are the primary objectives of the three studies I'm going to talk about. Um, the first um, study had a sample of 120. Um, our overall goal, this was, I wrote this probably in around 1999, 2000. What, what we realized when we started the sexual assault program is that there really had not been any work on the, on the sensitivity and specificity of the exam. Can it really do any prediction as far as uh, consensual versus non-consensual sex? So in this study, we enrolled 120 women, uh, half identified as white and half identified as African American. Cincinnati is a um, city that is primarily white and black. Uh, a growing Latino population, but at that time um, was less than 5%. So we decided to <coughs> enroll all white and black women um, because we wanted a, a balanced sample. Um, and what we did was uh, ask them, uh, we'd get informed consent, and then we uh, asked women to give in. We'd do a quick interview, and then we would ask them to come in after they had consensual intercourse for a forensic exam. And we looked at their injuries, and then we compared them. We also had the same protocol uh, at, at the hospital in the sexual assault program, so we compared the injuries of the women who came after consensual intercourse and those who came in after sexual assault. And we had some checks and balances to try to have similar time frames between um, the uh, women who were sexually assaulted and the women who had consensual sex. Surprisingly, not to those of you who do this work, but to me, who is a novice in this area, the, the mean time for people coming into the hospital after sexual assault was four to six hours. I had no idea that there would be that much time. 
And again, those of you who work in the field know people will come in three, four days sometimes afterward. But that was a learning curve for me. I had to learn. So we had to figure out how to make those two uh, groups of women fairly similar. Then the, the second um, study um, was based on some observations from the first study to determine if women after non-consensual sexual assault have significantly greater prevalence of intercourse-related injuries as compared to non-consensual, but we began to look at the issue of skin color, and I'll show you how we kind of got there. And then in the third study, uh, with 600 women, we added a Latina sample and had a, a multi-site um, study uh, partnering with the University of Puerto Rico as well as in, at Penn. So um, let's look a little bit of data from the first study. This was 120 women um, who came in uh, after consensual intercourse and, a, and with a well-controlled um, situation. So we had a pretty good idea of what happened when they had the consensual intercourse, uh, a controlled exam. Uh, and when we first ran these data, we really, uh, I looked at these data about halfway through the study. So I think we had enrolled maybe 70 people at the time. And there was this sharp black-white difference. The, uh, the uh, women who identified as white had uh, a, a higher injury prevalence, so significantly higher injury prevalence than women who identified as black. And we, were, we really just did this when we were looking at routine demo demographics. And um, I said to the team, okay, I mean, this just doesn't make sense. Why, why would race ethnicity have anything to do whatsoever about injuries after sexual assault? And, um, how are we ever going to frame this or talk about possible explanations for this? It just doesn't make sense. Uh, patterns of intercourse shouldn't be all that different. There's nothing anatomic to suggest this. It shouldn't matter how people identified with race ethnicity. And I was really troubled by this and also troubled by reporting this and then making any kind of argument that made sense. So I, 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 what I said to my team is, you know, we're just going to stop here. We're not going to publish this. We're going to stop and we're going to think about this. We're going to take a month or two off, really work it through, because um, I'm not going out there to discuss and speculate, because I didn't like the what would be speculated about that. Just, it just didn't make sense. At that point, I was pretty young and not knowledgeable about health disparities or not knowledgeable how to, how to think about this. I was a fairly young investigator, and I just, just, just didn't um, work for me. And the more I thought about it, um, I, didn't, I don't do the exams myself, but of all the exams that I observed, I realized that I was m much more comfortable as a clinician with light skin with understanding the injuries that occurred in women who were similar to me. And that I couldn't always see the injuries on people with darker skin in the same way. And I think there were a couple of reasons. First of all, injuries can be more difficult to see in darker skin. And we all do better with doing an exam on someone who is more like ourselves because we're just more comfortable with that. Um, so um, I decided we really needed to, to forget about this race ethnicity thing and run with that clinical perception of mine that maybe this was about skin color. And I couldn't find anything in the literature about this. I found a few studies. There was a, a study in the 90s that talked about after birth, women with light skin seem to have more, uh, more injuries than women with dark skin. Um, but there looked like there might have been some bias in how that was written about who was getting what treatment, who would get episiotomies, what level of care people would get. So I, I really wasn't sure that that was helpful in, this, in thinking through this. Um, and, and then when I looked at a, a number of series and actually tried to tease out the prevalence, I could see some trends in large data set groups that there were, seemed to be more injuries when they divided by race ethnicity, but nobody talked about skin color in those either. They just laid out the uh, epidemiology. So I decided that, um, I, first of all, I needed to think about our data in, in the sexual assault group to see if there was the same thing. So this is the, this is the uh, non-consensual, or this is the consensual group. So we pulled the data from our sexual assault group and we matched them. We took 120 women. Um, and uh, in the sexual assault program, uh, and we looked at older women and younger women, we found the same thing. We found a higher injury prevalence in white women after sexual assault than in black women. So, I, so once I saw that, I thought, okay, there's something here, so let's start exploring how, 
what might be uh, um, explanations um, why this racial difference is occurring when there's really no theoretical reason. And I moved to trying to understand skin color. So I was suddenly in a whole different, I'm an injury scientist, I was in a whole different ball game. Um, and um, again, we stopped data collection in, in the meantime. And I said, okay, so I, I'm gonna learn everything I can about color analysis, skin color. What we, because we had been taking digital images of these injuries with the colposcope. So uh, how, what are the best ways to quantify injury when, you're, when you have digital images? How can we up, uh, increase our science? Uh, and that landed me just up the road from you, I don't know which way, at RIT, uh, where they, and thanks to Kodak, who I guess no longer exists. But they have a wonderful color science injury, uh, or color science imaging group. And I came here and took some a week coursework and learned everything you always wanted to know about uh, digital image analysis and color science. And what I learned was um, that color, color spaces are uh, um, um, models, theoretical models, that look at color in a number of ways. And you have to pick, just like with any science, you have to pick the right color space to match what you're doing. So uh, when you buy your printer cartridges, you buy a cyan, a yellow, and a magenta, right? That's one color space that works well on print media. When you look at your video, you're using the RGB color space, the red, green, blue color space, which is the box at the top there. Those aren't the best color spaces for the kind of work that I was doing because I was trying to assess digital images. And the best way to assess di digital images is what's called uh, the LAB color space, which looks at uh, lightness darkness, which is the L. It looks at the uh, yellow-blue continuum, and it looks at the red-green continuum. And there are a lot of um, reasons with the physics of light that that's the best color space having to do with the space between the colors. Um, but that was the best way to, to learn. So I had to learn all about the metrics of the LAB color space, <clears throat> hue, chroma, and lightness, so that we could begin to do some qualifications or quantification of, of skin color. Um, and you can see in this lower illustration just uh, the, the nuances of color. Um, the the uh, hue is a red-violet color, but you can look at the lightness darkness and see how that changes across color. And then you can also look at the chroma, which is the concentration of color. And it goes from not much concentration over to heavily concentrated. So all those can be measured, um, quantified, um, and uh, if you really want to figure out what color someone's skin is. So that's the, that's the model that we used. Um, so our color measurements run uh, from zero, which is black, to 100, which is white. Um, and then the A axis and the B axis, the red, green, yellow, blue, uh, is infinite. But when you get to the practicality of measuring it, it usually runs from a positive 240 to a negative 240. So finally, we had a system to look at a digital image and actually quantify someone's skin color. You can do all kinds of things. You can hold up color tiles. You can, there are lots of ways to do it, but um, this was NIH. We had to uh, use uh, the, best, uh, the best metric that we could. So um, we had this um, skin color difference that looked like it was based on race ethnicity, but as soon as we um, added to our models the LAB values, skin color went away. Skin color, or I mean, um, uh, race ethnicity didn't matter. It didn't really matter how someone self-identified. What mattered was how dark their skin was. People with dark skin had lower injury prevalence. People with light skin um, had higher injury prevalence. And that made much more sense to me. That also takes out the whole issue of race ethnicity being a politically constructed, socially constructed something, and made it more easy to talk about, think about, about what was going on here. Um, and that led me to thinking, OK, what's going on here then? Is skin actually different? And if you talk to surgeons and dermatologists, they will say that there is a bounciness resilience in black skin or people with darker skin than you see with people with very fair skin. They'll, they'll talk about just clinically, the, the scalpel feels different on different types of skin. Um, um, you look at some of the dermatology uh, research, people with darker skin seem to have better skin tone 
sometimes people don't look like they age as much. There, 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 just seem, there does seem to be difference. But there's not a lot of science that says, um, that really explains those differences. So, so that maybe there is something anatomic about skin that varies. We know that, that uh, people with dark skin have an extra skin layer. We know that anatomically. But how that plays out, we don't know. Um, maybe um, the skin elasticity is, is different, and that would explain the differences. Or maybe the exam, examination techniques just are not good for dark skin. You know, so much of dermatology research up until about 1990 was based on people with light skin. Um, the uh, identifying conditions, looking for ecchymosis, um, uh, the Fitzpatrick uh, skin scale, which has been used for years by term dermatology, it's based on, on uh, light skin. Um, that Fitzpatrick scale has seven components, um, one through six components. One through five are based on uh, people with lighter skin. And then there's this last category that just says black skin. Well, I can tell you as a skin scientist, many, the many hats that I wear, when you look at how, when people self-identify, all the variation in skin color, much, much of the variation in skin color is in people who identify as black African American. There's very little variation in skin color in people who identify as white. So we have this scale that has all the variation for, for people who self-identify as white and one last uh, category for black skin when it really should be flipped because most of the variation is in people who say that they're black or African American or Latina. So um, I, I felt like we were trying to kind of re-envision also how, how people think about skin and, and categorize skin. So um, by, by thinking about is our, is our exam a problem, is, our, uh, is skin actually different, or is our, are our examiners a problem? Does it really matter who's doing the exam, or am I missing you know, is there something else that I'm totally missing? But why is it that uh, people with light skin have more injuries on these exams, both after consensual intercourse and uh, non-consensual intercourse, as compared to people with darker skin? Why does this matter? Well, it matters in the treatment of the injuries, but it really matters in the criminal justice system. Because if, as I said in the beginning, if, if you don't have as many injuries documented, then your case will not progress in the same way in the, in the criminal justice system. And that's where. Those differences in criminal justice outcomes are what drove then my concern about health disparities and criminal justice disparities, because that means that women with darker skin are not having as many injuries identified, and their cases won't move forward. Uh, the prosecutors won't push them forward, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it got us to a very different place than simply trying to look at the sensitivity and specificity of the exam to protect consensual versus non-consensual um, intercourse. Um, so in addition to that, um, I began to think a lot about what else, uh, what else we should be thinking about with these data. Because we had uh, one study with 120 women, and then recently I, I finished enrolling an additional 600 women after consensual intercourse. And um, it, has, it has troubled me about what we ask uh, women to do in these studies because they, um, in our, on our second studies, we do a baseline forensic exam. They have intercourse at a prescribed time. We, we tell them when to have intercourse with their partner. And we kind of work with them about, you know, what's your schedule? When's your partner going to be home? Which we have cells that, you know, indicate. Uh, and, and then they come back in, they have another forensic exam and with swabs and all kinds of imaging and whatever. So, you know, we, we really ask the human subjects toll on uh, this group of women is high. Now, you may ask, how do you recruit? We have waiting lists. Women are like amazing, and and they have they have many stories about why they want to come and why they'll have intercourse with their partners at a at a, at a set time. But we we've never had trouble in enrolling, which is is pretty amazing. Um, but I got to thinking also about the other consequences and what other contributions we might be able to make besides teasing out this issue of of criminal justice disparities. Um, and physical injury does have consequences. Um, this is a kind of disturbing um, study by um, Geist in 1988, uh, looking at 
Uh, sexual violence in children, 535 children from 0 to 13 years of age. What they were trying to look at was what kinds of sexually transmitted infections they had after uh, there was child abuse. And you can see a, a, a fair number of these kids did have um, some kind of sexual um, 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 infection. Um, now, causation, you can't say this is causation because of the sexual assault, uh, because it's screening after the fact. So uh, you don't know at what point, but clearly at some point during their childhood, during sexual abuse, they uh, were exposed to some degree of infection. Um, and in this series, uh, none of the kids had HIV, but this was also done prior to uh, 1988. Um, and there's been a, a growing thinking about the role of, of genital injury and in HIV transmission, especially as rates of HIV have skyrocketed in women. Um, and there's been a, a group of scientists that have meeting, been meeting about this. This is from a paper uh, from Jennifer Klott uh, and the Green Tree Group, which is the group that's been meeting about this in, in 2012, which, with a really uh, intriguing model that tries to get at HIV tr risk, but as you can see, one of the issues is genital injury. So I think the whole question of uh, women after sexual assault and their risk of HIV is very strong. Now, it's, it's hard to study because you don't know who's going to be sexually assaulted. So to get any kind of causation is tough. You, you don't have a baseline measurement of, the, of whether they're seropositive or not. But we know that this is uh, potentially one reason why so many uh, women are um, having increased uh, rates of HIV. So I think I was interested in seeing how our data could perhaps inform this discussion. So we, uh, we looked at uh, a longitudinal observational design of our, of our current data from the, six, the series of 600 women. Uh, we, uh, what we looked at was a group of uh, women who were menstruating and not using hormonal birth control a woman, women who were menstruating using hormonal birth control and then menopause. Um, one of the, the, in the, the model, the previous model that I just showed you, um, one of the thinking is that it matters, a woman, the hormonal environment of the woman matters whether they get HIV or not. And we did find, just in a preliminary looking at our data quickly, that uh, women on birth control pills um, had higher rates of injury. So that's kind of what took me down this route. Um, and then uh, we also looked at menstrual phase to see if that's different because I'm not an HIV researcher, but some of the, the foams and protective birth control devices and are, are, um, are looking at whether at one point in the woman's cycle people are at more risk and should they uh, use more caution depending on where they are in their uh, menstrual cycle when they have intercourse at, at any point. Um, and what we found was that women using hormonal birth control had a 38% uh, uh, more uh, external genital injuries. So maybe that's the case. Maybe people on birth control pills are more at risk for HIV. And in looking at large community samples, when you're trying to initiate um, HIV prevention in large groups, maybe that's something people ought to think about with um, who's being put on um, uh, hormonal birth control and who's not. Uh, menopausal women had three times the amount of uh, anal injuries, and among menstrual women, it seemed that the follicular phase was the, the phase that uh, placed women at most um, risk for injuries. So that work is really just starting to, to look at how our data, how important our data are to uh, trying to figure out some of this uh, HIV uh, risk exposure. And then another area that we've been working on is, 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 the, is the forensic exam really appropriate across the continuum of skin color? Does it, uh, is it really set up to advantage people with light skin and disadvantage people with dark skin? Um, those of you who have seen the exam, the contrast media that's used to highlight the injuries is, is to dean blue in most sexual assault programs. It's a navy blue color. Um, it does really well on light skin to highlight injuries. So people with dark skin, it doesn't do such a good job because there's really not much contrast between the dark blue and um, uh, the darker skin. So um, with the help of an SBR, um, SBIR grant and working with a company who does image analysis, we tried a variety of combinations of fluorzine. Um, if you wear contacts, fluorzine is what they put on your 
uh, cornea to see if you have corneal abrasions. It's kind of an orangey um, color. And then if you take pictures or use the right magnification, it, it you know, flares up and glows. And so we have been trying a, a different combinations of fluorzine and other contrast to see then if that can highlight injuries um, better uh, than just the, the tolidine blue, which is that dark blue. Um, this is part of my research that I'm passing on to the future generation as I'm kind of winding down. Um, and there are some people who are tackling this and trying to see if they can refine these techniques and then um, try, try do clinical trials with it. Um, that's all down the road a little bit. But I think that we can do much better with all women if we kind of begin to change some of our techniques that, um, uh, based on uh, the work we've done so far. And this, this is the last um, slide I wanted to show you, and then we can open up for questions and comments. And um, I look forward to all of your experiences in the room. Um, this is our, our first pass effort. Uh, so we have, in the, last, in the study that I just finished, we had 600 women after consensual intercourse, and then um, um, about seven or 800 women across several sexual assault programs. So we have, again, the consensual and the non-consensual sample. Now, I have to say to you, I'm the first one to acknowledge that you know, exactly what is consensual sex and exactly what is non-consensual sex. I mean, you know, I, I get that, and I think that that is an issue. We've actually had some women come into the study in the consensual arm. We get consent, we get consent from the partners. Um, the partners know it all, the women know it all, they have this baseline exam, intercourse, follow-up exam, and we've had some women who have come back in who have said, even though I had this all set up, I was raped. He was drinking. He did stuff I didn't want him to do. Um, and so those women come out of the, the consensual sample. But you know, I know full well that this is not this simple. I'm sure all these people had consensual. I'm sure all these people had non-consensual. So there is, I'm the first one to admit that there's some, you know, some error in, in how these groups are consisted. But, is with all science, we did the best we could. But I, what, we, what we found here, this is the consensual group. This is the non-consensual group. Um, and what we found, at least in our uh, preliminary work with latent class analysis, is that there were two classes, less, severe, more, more, less severely injured, more severely injured, in both groups. And there is a beginning sense that there may be some of these internal injuries that seem predictive of lack of consent. The external injuries in our sample don't really seem to be showing difference, but it seems like when, when women are injured internally, I call this my Kobe Bryant finding, because the, the young woman that accused Kobe Bryant of rape had, had a, I think, a third or a fourth degree laceration in her vagina. That just doesn't happen in consensual intercourse very often. I mean, it's extremely rare. So it seems, at least from our data, that when women have some um, uh, um, internal injuries, not just a, some um, discomfort, some redness, a little tear, but those internal injuries do seem to be pointing more toward a uh, lack of consent. And we'll, we'll be doing more work with these data. We're just uh, beginning the work. So my thoughts about where we need to go, uh, replication, the whole issue of skin color and whether skin color really matters, needs to be replicated in, in larger samples and better control. Um, what we find is that our, our exam, our forensic exam, is so well controlled and we have specially trained um, examiners and they tend to find every little injury that occurs in the consensual women. When you, um, even when you train uh, sexual assault examiners in the clinical area, their priority is the clinical needs of the, of the patient. So um, a lot of time, and they they're not as, every little injury that really they feel is not very important doesn't always get documented. So you get this um, really scrupulous exam with the consensual women then, and then a, a more clinical exam with the non-consensual women and that obviously is gonna, is gonna put some air into the group. So that's an issue. I think more work needs to be done with the contrast media to make sure that that's matched across skin color. Uh, the green tree model and the links between sexual assault and HIV transmission, HIV risk, and how injury plays into that, I think is a fertile line for work. And I'm hoping, again, my, the colleagues coming behind me 
Um, Bridget, Bridget Bronner at Penn is working on that. She was the first author on the, uh, the paper I showed you um, on data, and that was just out in um, Jade's Journal of uh, AIDS last year. <clears throat> and then just developing skin science to figure out uh, are there really differences across skin color in the nature of skin, and does that matter, and how should that, how should that help us interpret the injuries that women have after sexual assault. That, so that's kind of where I am. Uh, I may be recently retired, but I'm still a work in progress, and my work is still a work in progress. But I think we have some, a good start on this, and um, hopefully we'll keep um, building and trying to understand this a little bit better. Um, so I've moved to being, continuing to be an injury scientist, but an injury scientist who really pays attention to health disparities and trying to work through the multiple complexities of what happens when people are disadvantaged by, for multiple reasons, because of their gender identity, because of their sexual orientation, because of their skin color, because of their race, ethnicity, because of all those, and how that interfaces with the whole issue of injury broadly and violence against women. So I'm happy to take questions, comments, thoughts. I'm very happy to learn from all of you and rethink uh, where I am with my own work. So we just want to open things up and see, you know, what, how are we doing on time, Ellen? Do we have, we're doing okay? Okay, good. So please, you know, comments? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, that was extremely interesting, especially from someone who's not coming from the science background. Um, my, I just, it's just a small question about the study. Um, were there screening questions around using lubricants? Yeah, so we even, um, um, these, these women were just penal size, roughness of sex, um, uh, positions, how long foreplay occurred. Um, um, I used to say to my team, if my father only knew what I was asking, he would. <laughs> a very conservative father, he would have said, I thought you were like going to be a nurse and help people, and now you're asking them this stuff. Um, so we had a lot of help um, with our instrument development with uh, a number of people who have done um, um, sexual behaviors kinds of things. I think that's one of my take home messages, you know, consultants, other scientists, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Because you know, you, your questions lead you to other questions and you don't have the expertise to answer those questions. And thank goodness scientists are a wonderful community that help each other out and say, yeah, I can help you with that. I can teach you something that you know absolutely nothing about so you can take your next step. So, so we did a lot of control of that. Um, and we warned women as they signed consent. We had quite a lengthy informed consent document, and it was very well scripted because there were a lot of things that we had to warn them about and um, let them know how intrusive we were going to be. And again, women women are wonderful. So the, the consensual group was it was they were allowed to do anything that they usually do during sex. They just had to report it afterwards. Right. So we we asked them. Um, I had some pushback from some of my students because we asked them to have sex with a man. And we had a lot of dialogue about this. Um, sexual assault is primarily a man-on-woman issue, but same-sex couples have sexual assault. When we looked at the literature, and especially with women having sex with women, it's more apt, the injuries that occur are less likely to be anogenital and more likely to be about the head and the face, the shoulders. And we decided, at least in this beginning, we would be having women who, have, women who had sex with men. Now, many of the women had different sexual patterns, different partners, but for this study, it was an, an inclusion that they needed to agree to have sex with men. Um, we, we had some women who hadn't had sex with men for quite some time but wanted to be in the study and had sex with a man. So uh, we thought about how that <laughs> might, <laughs> but we, you know, if they wanted to be in this, you know, and at this point, you know, if they wanted to be in the study, they, we were grateful and, you know, we, yeah. So we, it was, uh, we, we tried to think about that carefully. I, I think we made the right decision this time out, but more work needs to be done in people who have sex with multiple people and how that plays out, because that's really important. There's nothing out there on that, and that, that's an important area. Somebody up here. Yes, go ahead. Um, were the people whose female partners were enrolled in this study, like, were they given the results of that day's exam too? Like, were the, the men? Yes. And or, no. Or, or were the women themselves given the results of that day's exam? Because I yes. wonder how much talk goes into that. Like after the first time, like, well, I had these injuries, and he's like, oh crap, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then the next yeah. time, 
they, they alter their patterns or not alter the patterns, yeah. given, on, like, given what they found. Right, good question. So um, the, the men were, sorry, the men were simply vehicles to have intercourse with, and they, they agreed, but that's all they got. You know, they didn't get compensation, they just, we got consent. So, so the women got all the information, so, and the women were the ones that were, were compensated. And we paid them well. I think overall, through, if they went through all steps, they got about $300, so, uh, or three, 350 actually, which they absolutely deserved. You go through a, you know, a forensic exam, you know. Uh, we got some pushback from NIH, but not much about the compensation. I would have liked to give them even more. I'm sorry? I know. Well, so where, where, where's our attorney? So we called, we called the Philadelphia prosecutor, the, the Philadelphia, whatever the office is that do violence against women, whatever. And we said, okay, can we do this? Are you going to arrest? I could see the headlines. Penn professor arrested for pandering, right? <laughs> okay. She said, your consent, she said, yes, <laughs> you know, that could happen. So she said, your consent documents need to be very clear. You're paying them for the exam. You are not paying them to have sexual intercourse. You are paying, and as long as you do that, I won't take you to court. So we were really careful. We worked. I, I, I called the IRB and said, okay, just make sure when this is reviewed, this is what we're trying to do. So if there's any question, these women, are, and so we worded things very carefully. And women, they could watch, they could watch on colposcopy. They could look at the digital images if they wanted. Um, so we talked them through uh, what we found. Um, so the women had all the data, and we didn't tell the men anything. Like, we felt like it was the woman's exam. If she wanted to share it, she could. No, but I'm saying, I wonder if she would go back to her partner. I don't know. That's a really good question. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. We didn't have anybody with terrible injuries, but we had some women with 8, 10 injuries after consensual intercourse. Yes. Two questions. One is, um, if you noted any other demographic change, um, differences, and then the... Other question was, has the work penetrated the courtroom? So, good questions. Um, I noticed in, at Penn that our uh, people who identified as, uh, in, as some kind of group that was not white, whatever, and I have trouble with those <laughs> categories, but we have, you have to do something when you work with NIH. So. Our, our white sample was primarily people from on campus, research assistants. We had physicians. We had, you know, all kinds of people who wanted to be in the study. Our non-white sample tended to be more community. And the West Philadelphia community is a community that is very diverse uh, economically. The Penn community is less diverse economically. So that piece is in there. I, we haven't really seen anything yet when you look at the data that that mattered, but th that was the one thing that I noticed. And I, if I did this again, I might stratify on SES, because we didn't this time. And I think that's probably important, because what your nutrition is like, then is your skin is more fragile if your nutrition's not good, if you don't you know, have a adequate access, if you're sharing bathrooms, if you, if you don't. You know, if there are multiple people living together, those, those things might make a difference as far as your hygiene and then whether you're going to get injured or not. And we didn't, we didn't have any control over that. And tell me what your second question um, is. Has the work penetrated the courtroom? So um, there is an a, um, organization, I think it's national, you'll need to, is I, Equus? Equus? It's pro a prosecutor organization. So, uh, and, um, um, Chris Malios was is is a he's now a judge in Philly, but he was working with them nationally, and he has shared this with them, and it's certainly out there in the literature. But one of our folks with uh, legal and criminal justice background would have to tell me how much how much dissemination's been done. But I know Chris has done a lot at the national level about the skin color difference and how how it might impact. I haven't really heard anything to the Family Justice Center which the domestic violence uh, organization here, but I'm definitely going to take it back and mm -hmm. see that how prevalent this could be right here in, in Buffalo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the other piece that I know, the, the sexual assault guidelines now that comes out from NIJ, National Institute of Justice, does talk about skin color. Uh, just with because it, it provides information on dye, the dyes, the contrast medias, and the, and the and they do talk about the need to 
Um, so that's a good start. I mean, that means, okay, we're, but you know, it says what? You do a study and then 10 years later, if it's in practice, you're lucky. But I think there is a growing awareness that we just have to be careful what we think we're seeing, especially with this disparity. Yes, go ahead. So it, it, the entire presentation, which was so wonderful, I'm an epidemiologist by training, um, but I do primarily health promotion, so I'm interested in um, this from sort of a, both a medical but also a social and cultural perspective, that this was a really good example of how racism is institutionalized. And it's something that people like don't always want to get their heads around, but the mm -hmm. fact that both the process and the outcomes are, have some connection to a racial bias or invisibility or however you want to frame it, it's really important for us as providers and community people and researchers to, you know, get. You know, it took my breath away. The first time I looked at that Fitzpatrick scale, this, this skin color scale that dermatologists use, and all of this was for basically white skin. I think they got, at this point, was a little descriptor of like Mediterranean skin, whatever that is. And then there was this black category. And then we looked at our data, and the white women's skin color was here, and the black women's skin color was here. So, <laughs> duh. You know, so you have these five categories for these people, and then you have one category for these people. And it's like... How unscientific. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and people say that, that our institutions don't have that racial... I mean, you know, come on. So uh, we're getting ready to actually to publish the data that show um, where... Because we've asked, we asked the women where they fit here, and then we have their skin color, and then we have their self-identified race ethnicity. And the, it's fascinating how this plays. So we're hoping, I'm working with um, uh, a dermatologist who's been on our project, and I'm hoping that he's going to um, help us get this into one of the, the top um, dermatology journals. Now, to be fair to this scale, this was, this was developed for sun, sun exposure. Like, you know, how much sun do you get, whether you sunburn. But the, the, but the issue of... Well, you guys can tell me in the room, those of you who have darker skin, the, the issue that people with darker skin don't sunburn is like nonsense. So, <laughs> you know, so in some ways it was um, set up with, and it was in the 70s, but that's no excuse. I mean, that's, that's when people say, you know, we're fine, what are you talking about? There are no, you know, we're in a multiracial society. I mean, you know, <laughs> right, sorry, my politics will... But, you know, it's, it's not scientific, it's not a good scientific argument, no matter what your, poli your politics are, it's just not okay. Yeah. So for external injury, or yeah, external skin, the, those are the variation, what is a genital mucosa variation? For, is that a similar, would you see a similar scale for that genital mucosa <coughs> color change? No, so that's a really good question because, you know, most of our skin measurements, that we'll, as we're trying to get at, are there really differences, and we're, we are in our, series with 600 women, we've looked at uh, skin elas viscoelasticity, skin hydration, uh, and um, body mass index, um, lean body mass, a, a lot, because people who, I, my skin is not going to be injured as much as somebody who's very s slim, because I have some padding. So we know people who are, especially in the, people in who are very, very thin and very, very heavy have more skin injury. But those of us in the middle, especially those of us in the overweight category, don't injure as much. So that's also a, a piece of this. So, um, but those measurements are all done most typically on the um, right here, because when you look at the science, that's the least as compared to um, lower arm, lower legs, Thighs, th this is where your natural skin color is most likely to be based on the science. So we do the measurements here, and that's different than the mucosa that you're talking about, even the external genitalia mucosa. And so is that transferable? That's another issue. But you can't do the skin measurements in da on damp skin. You can't do viscoelasticity, skin hydration on mucosa. So what we're finding about this skin might not transfer to genital injuries. And, and most of the external genital injuries are still in that mucosal area that's damp and, and different. You know, the, 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 cell, the cells are different than the cells here. So again, uh, some error in those measurements. Yeah? 
Um, I have a question, kind of the, the external versus internal yeah. injuries. Um, and pardon my night today, I am not a doctor <laughs> at all. Um, is there, was there more difference, the same difference, or less difference in, it? I'm kind of curious by, by race in the difference between internal and external injuries, because yeah. I'm not sure exactly people look different. how different, how much, is if it have, inside? Yeah, <laughs> if, if you have dark skin externally, do you look different internally? Pretty much no. <laughs> we kind of look the same inside. Um, so um, we really haven't found much that the racial differences, the race ethnicity difference, and the skin color differences were mainly external. We did do um, mucosal color on the inside, and it's, it's messy. It's, um, the inside of women isn't messy, but I mean the, the data are very messy <laughs> about how, because it's very hard, you know, you have those of you who know that you have rugae, you have like waves and, and the pigment it varies and, and so it's not as clear. Um, and then the other thing that we had to learn really early on, fortunately from, I work with a wonderful um, uh, family uh, medicine uh, physician who uh, is, is a women's health person, and, and your cervix, when, you're, when you have normal hormones, your cervix goes through lots of different changes. And some of, sometimes it's red, sometimes it's not. And those don't have anything to do with injury, that has to do with your hormones. So teasing out what really is hormonal change on the cervix and actual injury change has been also a challenge. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. And similarly, I'm thinking, I'm just sitting here thinking about how complex it is and the heterogeneity among women. And I was wondering at the beginning of your talk what your age range of women in your studies were because one of your small findings that you alluded to um, regarding menstrual cycles and hormonal um, issues was that men, that um, menopausal women were at higher risk for anal injury. And I was wondering if you had any conjectures about that and yeah. about that, like how these this would also differ by age. Like I wondered if demographics in terms of age. Yeah, so we had, we had all the way up to 70 and 80 year old women, which I, I just, like I said, I love women, I just love, you know, like, you know, we had a woman, uh, a woman who came in in her wheelchair and we had to specially rig the, um, the table to make her comfortable during the exam. I mean, you know, just women are, are wonderful. So we, we, there are, we definitely have seen some age differences in our data. And I think that's probably the estrogen effect that as women don't have estrogen on board, they tear more easily. Uh, and when they're older, they're more likely to have hormone, uh, um, hemorrhoids. So the women who had the anal injury didn't necessarily, didn't, most of them hadn't had anal intercourse. But we also, you know, sometimes during foreplay, there's, um, penetration, finger penetration, whatever. So we're still trying to kind of work that out and see if that was the reason for the increased anal injury or if it was just trauma to the whole area um, during the intercourse um, situation. There's no question that in sexual assault, uh, you know, we know from Jackie Campbell's work that um, sexual assault and, and anal rape is associated with um, intimate partner violence, par partner violence, not um, um, the unknown assailant, which we know isn't very typical anyway in sexual assault. Um, but it's, it's, mar it's a mark of marital rape or, or you know, people living together rape. Um, we haven't really seen any trends in, in the anal intercourse data um, in the consensual group um, because we, the sample's fairly small of 400 women. I think maybe 15 to 20 had had anal intercourse as part of the consensual intercourse, and we really haven't seen anything that helps us figure that out at all. I, did I answer your question? Yeah, I, yeah, okay. I think I kind of wandered around. <laughs> yeah, I think there is, there is clearly an aging um, piece, and now that most women don't go on hormone therapy, I think, um, yeah. But then we also saw people on birth control had more injuries, so, you know, is too much, you know, too many of the hormones, you know, that's, we're still working on that. I mean, at least we have a nice sample to look at that, but even 600, you know, when you look at epidemiology study, that's a small study, so. Yeah. Could you tell me just how, what are your plans for sort of taking this into the policy arena with yeah. prosecutors, et cetera? Is it way too early, or do you feel that even at this stage, I mean, it's <coughs> really to some of the other questions? Well, we have worked some with that, and, and as I said, Chris Malios was great when he worked for, uh, 
um, Equus, which is the yeah. that prosecutor group. Um, the um, Ortner Institute at Penn, um, um, Susan Sorensen directs it at the Social Policy and Practice Institute, um, has done a really good job helping me. And we're having a big conference, a national conference, at the end of this month. And I'm on that panel to talk about these things. And we're going to talk about how this relates to policy. And NIJ has been very receptive to the, the data. And the Green Tree Group also uh, has, has, has worked with me about how it relates to HIV. But I think we are early on. I think that whole issue of getting the word out, you know, when, this, when the paper came out um, with the smaller sample, the 120, um, it got a lot of buzz. It was all over the place, but then, you know, it goes away. So I think it's a huge, getting it out there in policy, getting people to pay attention and uh, think about it is a, big, is a big issue. I mean, the funding opportunity is obviously mentioning NIJ. I mean, if you can get combined um, NIJ, NIH funding, then we can go through these things together. You could. Yes, yeah, so, so the young woman at, at University of Virginia um, who's working, who is taking that contrast media issue, you know, that the, the, blue, ish, the blue dye maybe isn't the best, she's working right now uh, in an animal model, and they have some small NIJ funding for that. But what they really are going to need is another, you know, a three and a half million. Once they figure out what's what, they're going to need three and a half million to try that out in a large series. And, I have found violence against women money very tough to get. Uh, National Institute of Nursing Research and NIMH have partnered to do some of that. I think it's most likely going to be N NIMH. I don't think nursing is going to, uh, you know, go there anymore because um, they've moved on to, to other priorities. So I think NIJ and National Institute of Mental Health probably are the ones that are going to be more like although NICHD the child health and human development funded the the um, the bench work we did with with the contrast media that came out of child the child institute so I think it's it's being savvy about who to ask for what um, that the um, the health disparities institute doesn't have a whole lot of money and I, I I I don't know that they would go this way but maybe maybe you don't know Need me to sit down? No. <laughs> <laughs> I will. It is, it thank is, it is time for everyone. Thank yeah. you very much for Thank you all. The great questions. Appreciate it.